So today on the Tim Miner podcast show, I've got my mate Kev from Revolution. So lucky. Breath coach, cold water yeah. therapist. Supposedly. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, I don't know if you've had this conversation before. How did you get into it in the first place, doing like being a breath coach and the cold water? How did you get into it initially? You've probably had this conversation before with people, but I've never. I think we maybe have touched on it a couple of times. I think we probably did on the day, but the day that I met you and you and Kay over at Coombs, like it was, you know, we didn't really speak about much. Just got into it, didn't we? And just yeah. had a bit of a laugh. And yeah, it was mint. Yeah, it was good. It was a good day. Um, so basically, I was I was following Wim Hof for about three years before all this sort of kicked off. I'd read his book, um, and I was aware of it. And, and, and what breath work was to a degree, um, although I tried, I didn't really like it very much, I didn't do it again. But obviously I was, I was struggling with um, addiction. I've always struggled with addiction from the ages of about sort of, maybe sort of 20, 25, something like that onwards. And I was always in addiction at, at that point up until I was about sort of, you know, 40 until I stopped drinking. Um, and then what sort of got me into it was, is I, I met somebody in a tattoo shop, believe it or not, getting a tattoo. And he was getting a tattoo. He said, oh, I'm going down, I'm going down, I'm getting into, we're doing a bit of this Wim Hof breathing, we're going to go and get in the reservoir and uh, get in the cold water. I said, oh, I've often wondered about that. So I did, I went down and got in with him. And from that day, I was kind of hooked on... What was it that hooked you? It, it was the fact that you could feel like that without, without chemicals, without putting chemicals in your body anyway, at least. Obviously, I'm producing our, my own chemicals. When were you still taking this. drugs at the time when you were doing that, that first? No, no, no. I'd stopped drinking at that point. Um, and I'd already stopped drinking at that point because I lost my sister in 2019, Yvonne, and she was she was only 49. And it was enough trauma that I needed really to stop drinking. I was drinking every Tim, and um, I was drinking every day, probably, you know, maybe 15, 18 years. I'd gone through periods through that addiction to alcohol as an alcoholic. I went through periods at that time where I wasn't uh, drinking, but I'd normally take on um, stuff, a more addictive stuff. I'd, I'd have to be so focused in on something. I even embraced Islam at one point because there's no alcohol in Islam. So I did eight months off. I learned Arabic. I prayed in mosques. I wow. Did some, did some, yeah. Um, beautiful stuff. I absolutely, I really enjoyed that. It was, I met some incredible people. In, in some of the most beautiful buildings and, and prayed in some of the most beautiful buildings. And it was all really trying to get me away from addiction. The whole thing was, because I knew that with that, I was being watched and, you know, and, and, and I couldn't have alcohol. I kind of sort of, afterwards, I kind of discovered, you know, through reading the Bible and all the rest of it, uh, and looked into the Torah, Old, New Testament, the Quran. I read a lot of that, most of it. And um, it's really interesting, mate. That's really cool. I like that. I like <laughs> yeah, that. and it was at a time when everything was kicking off and yeah. everybody was just so against Islam. And um, I thought, well, what's all that about? I need to go and have a look. So I just went into a mosque. Um, and just got yeah. your own off your own back. Just you felt something and just did it. Well, yeah, I mean, my, the, the guy at the time, my, my, my hairdresser, when I, when I had hair that, that old time, <laughs> um, I'll talk to you about that in a bit because I might be going and getting some of those things done. But um, when, I, when I, my barber, he was, um, he was a Muslim and um, he, he was talking to me all about the faith and everything. This guy was really interesting, you know, and stuff. And he gave me a book uh, and I read it on holiday while I was in Greece. And I was like, wow, that's fascinating. Um, and, uh, and it kind of went on from there then. And, and, I, and I felt a deep connection with it. I stopped drinking and the deep connection sort of came together. So um, it was quite profound, really, but it allowed me to sort of witness um, existence and creation. And it made me quite emotional, again, uh, which I think was a bit of sort of mind-body connection that was happening to me as a person because I was without alcohol. Um, and it just allowed me to see the world a bit of a different way as I was reading about Islam and and how they, they, they put it, that you, you don't throw a hand grenade into a scrapyard and a Mercedes comes out. You know, it's not chance, it's, you know, divine creation. So I was kind of hooked on that, on yeah. that, on that um, idea, uh, which, which allowed me to sort of follow it and pray five times a day and, and, and do the whole thing. And, and it really helped, but at the end of it, I still was addicted to alcohol, so it got in there again. Yeah. And I was back on it before I knew. 
So anyway, so that was just one period of time that I went through crazy with the family because my dad was a, went to preschool with Catholics. So as you can imagine, that was a bit unusual for them all. And my poor wife, Sarah, at the time, because she was like, trying, what's going on with Kev this time? Because I was always so all over the place. Uh, and ADHD, I've, you know, I've always had ADHD, I think. Um, or what they refer to now as ADHD. And do you think that's where the, the addiction stemmed from, your ADHD, and your, your mind's always like fidgeting, that make, does the drink help you kind of shut off the noise a little bit? I think it did, Tim, to be honest. And, you know, and not just the drink, you know, I, I, I struggled with marijuana and cocaine and, mm. you know, and a lot of stuff, that, a lot of other addicts. When someone struggle. says they struggle with marijuana, because obviously there's a, there's a bit of a <laughs> shift now about people taking the marijuana um, and it's helping them focus and stuff like that. Yeah. I really struggle with that, as in, how, how does it do that? Because it's like, for me, I've always, I don't know, I've got a bit of a stigma of it numbing your senses, it kind of... You know, yeah, yeah. What what was it doing to you at the time when you were having the map? Was it again numbing the pain, numbing your thoughts? I think it probably was. Yeah, a bit of numbing, um, uh, but but not not numbing really. Sort of. I think what what my problem was, you know, and obviously I do this work every day now. I think not abandonment, but I I there was a certain time in my life where I needed a man around. Yeah. And there wasn't any. I was in a house with with all women. I had four sisters. Um, Yvonne, which is now is, is gone, and, and, and my mum. So I was just so surrounded by divine femininity all the time, and, and women and stuff, and makeup, and you know, I was always surrounded by women. So I think I struggled with men as a rule. And my dad was always working, bless him, you know, he was an amazing father. Couldn't ask for a better father. I love him to death. And but he just wasn't there for me as a as a boy that I the needed structure for. Yeah, for making stuff, for mechanics, for yeah. doing things, making things. I was always on my own. Yeah. And I think that definitely affected me going forward. And it affected my ego later on in life. Because I didn't know where to fit in. I didn't know, I didn't really know what anything was. I didn't even know how to be a man, really. Um, got into a fight at school. He'd always protect me. You know, he'd never let me sort of fight my own battles. And that always um, smothered me quite a lot. Yeah. So... Um, so that obviously I know now that that sort of affects men, you know, because I speak to so many men now when I'm doing retreats. I'll be honest, mate, you have got a really nice feminine energy about you, though. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? It's yeah, like yeah. when I first met you and stuff, it's like you feel so comfortable in your presence, like you give hug and I love that about you. But sure. then you have also got this really nice masculine tattoo side to you as well, which is probably something you've developed a bit later on. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. And I suppose, it, are these tattoos sort of me or are they part of the sort of that um, idea that I had of how a man should be, you know, yeah. this sort of thing at the time? And maybe a little bit of that as well. Yeah. Um, and how I should look, I should look tough all the time and, you know, um, perhaps trying to be something that really I wasn't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but you know, the tattoos, I just love it. I love the look yeah, now. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's all kind of changed, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah. Really, from uh, from that, how, I used to, how that used to be. And... You know, that sort of moves on to sort of, you know, um, the reason that I did it is is the, the cold water and the, and the breath became an addiction, really. Right. And I got addicted to how it made me feel. Um, and it started to sort of change my physiology, it started to make me feel better, sleep better. I could focus more. Uh, and and the noise in the head started to get a bit quieter. Right. So I started to overthink less. And then I look more into what Wim Hof was talking about, the Dalai Lama and uh, and Buddhist monks and what they were discussing. And certainly not just them, but, you know, the, the Prophet Muhammad, you know, Jesus, the Buddha, these, these these great human beings that have existed, obviously, in the past, Moses and, you know, these people that were around at a certain time, Abraham, um, and, and the amazing human beings that are like Eckhart Tolle. These are people that have just disappeared into the woods and caves and yeah. and found themselves gone on the hero's journey gone on the hero's journey yeah. that's what they say yeah this yeah. is it and they've they, they come back enlightened yeah. and it's just so abnormal to everybody else because they're still in the heads yeah they're all still in the thoughts yeah and they're not present and they came back present and everyone's like whoa it's just an, it's an amazing thing it's it's divine you know uh, messages from a, a higher being no, they just switched the noise off 
and they've realised how to do it and they realise that every human being is doing that. And, and that's the origins of anxiety, you know, because it's not possible to be a human being without complex anxiety because you'd be dead already. So, you know, I realised that, you know, quite early on, which is what sort of kind of sort of helped me to sort of sort of do my work a little bit. And how did what how did you sort of like put yourself within that hero's journey, or did you feel like you were already on that because you spent a lot of time on your own trying to fit in, thinking I'm just a you know average person, but then you accepted that journey, bit of resistance at first. Have, have yeah. you felt like you've been on that hero's journey yourself? Oh God, no, no. Um, uh, it's certainly not, no, no. Mm. And um, I've just been on mine. And I've got, have you never looked at that, though? Have you never looked at you've actually been on a hero's journey? <laughs> never thought about it like that. Yeah, I suppose, you know, to, to a degree, I suppose I have a little bit. Um, if I think about it that way, yeah, that's that, that's a, a good point. Um, and I suppose that's... Because that's the whole point of like, somebody who is a hero. They don't actually realise that they've been on the journey. Because the amount of people that you help and the way you come across, mate, and the way you philosophize, and the, the, to me, that is a hero in a in, in the oh, modern mate, world. Well, but unknowing to you, you've actually been on that journey. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose you know it's it's all in in terms of um, individuality. It's all about perception, isn't it? Yeah, and, yeah. and how you see yourself, and where you. Well, see that's yourself. how I look at you when I see you, mate. That is that is just so humbling. It really is, yeah. and you know. Um, I don't really ever think of that just like that, really. Yeah, but that's that's exactly what I hear, I would say. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose maybe, yeah. Because I, I, you know... And Mate, I'm, I, just look at how many people you must have helped. Oh, thousands. Yeah, know, thousands know, but, of but, people, like, yeah. But that's just like the one in a million person, that. Not everybody does that, Kev. No, the, no they really don't, no. you that and be, and be in that moment. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. Uh, and I do, but... I, I can't ever take away from the fact that I love doing this. Yeah. You know, um, and I speak to Katie and Kay says she loves doing yeah. this because she knows what people are getting from it. Yeah. And that's, if that's a hero, then of course, then I'll, I'll take a little bit of that hero. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, you're always trying to remain as, as humble, uh, humble and a yeah, bit of humility, yeah. as much humility as I can. So that you don't I think it's get just a pact of saying, oh, we're not saying, oh, look at me, but we're just kind of <laughs> looking in the mirror and thinking, you know, I'm really proud of the person that looks back at me. And that's, for me, that's a, another yeah, yeah. perception shift in your own mind to say, I'm really proud of that person who's looking back at me. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, I've, I've never sort of been, you know, too, too clever with that, you know, looking at myself and thinking, Kev, you know, you've done really well because yeah. you tend to, as a human being, you automatically sort of go, you look at the, yeah. The things that you did wrong, generally. Yeah. It's the nature of the nervous system to, yeah. to take you back to the things where you've made mistakes so that you don't do them again, obviously. Yeah. Um, so that's what comes up straight away. But more and more now, these days, I'm starting to... With the feedback that I'm getting and the testimonials yeah. that you get off people and, um, and just how much you've changed their lives, other people's lives. Could you give me an example um, of one person, you know, when you were first starting out, that you, you kind of thought to yourself... I met be doing this. The, yeah. A, a story of somebody that you just like. Yeah. I can. I can so, so tell you loads and um trying to tell you who they are without sort of getting emotional yeah. is difficult. Yeah. Um but yeah, people have, you know, have you know, one particular guy came to me who was suicidal, you know, he's in tears, he had everything. And he he's got an amazing business, a wife, some a beautiful children. Not not sh short of money, you know, um, really successful, and just felt like there was something missing, and, um, you know, when I did the session with him and took him through the process and stuff, he he literally went home, bought a barrel overnight, and and got in the cold every day, and it, it and you know, and he said to me, he said, you know, he said, um, excuse me, um, he said, that, you know, that that two hours, you know, saved my life, so you know, that's massive. I suppose when you're talking about the hero thing. Um, That's why it's important to share these stories, mate. And, yeah, and get, of course get it is. to actually verbalise and say it out. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes when you're in your own thing, you don't, you don't realise. No, you no. Emotion. You know that you're doing the right thing. You get emotional about that story that you've done with that person. Fucking hell, mate. Yeah, yeah. And look, this happens on a weekly basis now because yeah. there's just so much emotion that comes my way. There's so much trauma yeah. and abuse and... Um, 
Yeah, there's just so much. How, how, how do you handle that? Man, I know, I know, I know, I know. I, know. I don't, I, I just, oh, you know, I have a lot of people and I talk to a lot of people and obviously, but like, you're delving right into the fucking, like, dark bag there, aren't you, with people? Mm. Is how do you, how do you protect yourself in a way? <laughs> Yeah, people say say that to me a lot, and you know, I, I I take people through the process that are psychotherapists. I've I've worked with quite a lot of psychotherapists yeah. and psych, psychologists, and, and some doctors. I've taken in a a handful of general practitioners now, and and a particular you know a kidney doctor and a few you know people from all walks of life, obviously. Um, and they say to me, Kevin, you know, how do you how do you do that? And I I don't know really. Um, cause I don't really give it much thought. I just, I don't think too much about it, but I do mm. je- tend to sort of remember people from their trauma as opposed to remembering the name. Um, and I see them, I think, did, you know, I don't remember the name, but yeah, it's like, yeah. I remember that the they experience have, that they've had that. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I think generally that's what probably empaths do. They, they remember yeah. people's sorrow and, yeah. Um, and what they've been through. And of course, when you do transformative breath, you can't help but see it and witness it sometimes because they go through it a little bit again. Yeah. Um, and you can't help but feel emotionally in, in those times. So I suppose all the time, <clears throat> it's always there in me all the time, I think, all of it. Um, whether I carry it well or maybe I just carry it maybe a little bit different than other people. I mean, but I don't... do you think... Obviously, because like growing up in a household with loads of women, I don't think you'd be the practitioner you are today if that didn't. Because people, you've just got this way that people open up to you, mate. And <laughs> yeah, but that's because of what you've been through and you kind of this beautiful feminine empath energy about you that people just just share. They they do open up, yeah, yeah. and and literally, you know, I, I generally don't ask people. Yeah. But if I'm just walking out, it's just your energy, I know. <laughs> I don't know. But it's a power maybe, it's a gift, that, isn't it? M- maybe it is. Maybe it is. Yeah. Um, sometimes maybe it's a bit of a curse, maybe yeah. because I get a lot of it. Um, and even though I say just walking around Tesco's, oh, I, you're the breath guy, aren't you? And, yeah. You know. Yeah. You know. Sorry. Uh, you know, for all the people that sort of you know that that talk to me in Tesco's, you know, <laughs> I'm, I, I, I love listening to your stories and. You know, but yeah, they just, they just, you know, they open up and just say, oh, this is happening. And that's quite personal stuff. Yeah. Um, but I feel blessed that people can... Yeah, can, bless that, mate, innit? Can do that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, because some of them, they say, God, I don't even, I don't even talk to my own wife about these things. I don't even talk to my own husband about yeah. these things. I can't, um, you know, and I'm just, I feel just, you know, I feel safe in your presence. That means everything to me. Um, because it's uh, because the entire um, kind of makeup of the human body and, and the autonomic nervous system is safety. Yeah. The whole basis is on safety. Everything that we're doing day to day is is based on how vulnerable or how safe we feel constantly. So for people to feel safe with me, that that, that means the world to me. Um, but of course, yeah, I, I hear just so much. Tim, and I had no idea really at the beginning because I was just taking people in the cold water and I was saying, you know, breathe through your nose and breathe yeah. properly and try and slow your breathing down and, uh, and get used to the temperature. You've got to go through this transition and stuff. But now it's it's far more um, complex than that now, maybe because of what I've learned along the way yeah. in terms of polyvagal theory and the body keeps the score and, um, and how the autonomic nervous system works. Um, that it's kind of inviting a lot more sort of trauma, abuse, PTSD, and people that are in, you know, autonomic dysfunction through over-breathing. Yeah. And do you, do you go in, when you're doing this, do you go into, because obviously, you know, you only get like an hour with you, you're doing the breathing, the breath coach, but there's so much more to you about how you can help people. You're almost like a, a life coach in a way. Does that end, does that come into play usually after you, when you when you've done stuff and people message you and stuff? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I generally stay in, in in contact with most. Obviously, I can't um, I can't sort of stay in contact. There's, there's people that have messaged me. I've still not got back to yeah. people that have messaged me about the incident that happened this year, and it's because there's just so many people that, yeah. that are reaching out. But which is a sign that you know. 
so many people are anxious at the moment too. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Um, it's like the uh, silent pandemic, isn't it? It is really, yeah. yeah. And there's just so much of that connected yeah. to to the breath. And generally, my sessions are two hours long. The um, they used to be quite short the sessions, but now I feel compelled to give them as much information in that time as possible. Yeah. A lot of it they're probably not taking on board, but some part, the most important parts of it, they probably are. And the reason why I've kept, sort of kept my prices the way I've kept them, and I've kept the group sessions quite small, because I could have gone and done the big group thing. Yeah. I could have gone and loaded yeah, yeah, a load yeah. of tanks up. Yeah got 40, 50, 60 people in at a time making a killing. Yeah. But people aren't going away learning anything from that. Yeah. So that defeats the object, although it was tempting because somebody says, all oh, right, I'm going to give you 10 of these tanks. Yeah. You know, I'll give you a load of refrigerated units. I'm going to give them to you. Set up a big business, you know, let's let's make it big and get lots of people into this and we can, we can make some really good money. Yeah, but I, th I think that, for me, that's really the difference between a, a cold water experience and a cold water therapist. You're a cold mm -hmm. water therapist. Cold water experience you can do with big groups, but a cold water therapist is small, intimate. You're looking at people's energy. You're looking at the facial expressions. And for me, that's what you are. Sure. A million percent, you've got a gift, mate. And anybody can set up tubs and stuff. And, you know, first, if you do that, do that. Sure, but yeah. But you're not going to get into that dark bag no. and people want to get into that dark bag man sure absolutely and you know and, and, and Kay will know this doing yeah. her work you know um, and, and the people that she works with and the people that work with her some of them that have worked with me and gone and worked yeah. with Kay every experience is different but when you're guided and you're held yeah. and somebody's holding that space for you Oof, yeah. it's very very different oh, very different you know very it's a different, different ball game yeah. and you know People still all over this country now, they're still getting into Wim Hof sessions and these ice tank sessions yeah. and they're all still puffing and panting and still breathing into dysfunction. They're still breathing into sympathetic chain yeah. and they shouldn't be because that's not what Wim Hof wants. He wants you to be in control in the cold in, in two degrees, like when he gets in two or three degree cold, he, just... he never loses a breath. He's never on his breath. He's always, hey, come on, yeah, get in, as if it's nothing, yeah. because he doesn't feel it the same. He doesn't connect to it the same anymore, you know. And I know what he means yeah. by it. He just accepts it for what it is, but doesn't really particularly focus any attention on it at all, on the cold or the burning sensation. But most people that are going to these big events, they're paying the money. These uh, facilitators, they're making a killing. Yeah. And people are puffing and panting and yeah. panicking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, a lot I'm of them like, are anxious, yeah, yeah, and panicking. And they're doing a lot of very heavy breathing. Mm. They're getting into the cold. Yeah. They're, their autonomic nervous systems are like this. You see them on YouTube. They're, yeah. <laughs> they're puffing and panting through their mouth. They're in sympathetic drive. They're releasing adrenaline. Yeah. They're getting out. They're shaking off. And they, yeah, they have a wonderful time, yeah, a great time. But at the end of it, you know, what are they learning? What is what is their body learning from that from that experience? Nothing. What is what is the correct way to enter the water? Oh my god. I don't know. Um best ask an amphibian and maybe <laughs> 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 they'll know better. I don't do any of us know. I think that the thing that's been Is it is it an individual person my person? Obviously your per perception on this is that everybody enters the water differently depending on who they are or is there a certain way like kind of slow and steady regulate your breathing don't yeah. panic i think because um your autonomic nervous system is as unique as your dna because it's it's only ever witnessed from you your perception is is your makeup it's it's how your body stores information um, everybody that enters the water enters completely differently in terms of the perception of the environment, safety, vulnerability. And everybody's nervous system will try different ways to get you to come out. So sometimes people say that, oh, that the hands, which is why when they get into these tanks, you know, you, they're like this and they're like this. It's because the, the, the hands are... Um, the hands, sorry, I put my hands in front of the microphone then, but the hands are quite painful when you go in the cold. They're very sensitive, the hands. 
because we use them for very sensitive and loving things. So, and we, sometimes we might use them a lot for work. People that, you know, tattooists and things like that and beauty therapists, they come in and they, because the autonomic nervous is, whoa, 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 you know, you need these, this is what you, you know. So it'll try and get you, try and make your hands feel worse to make you, to, to get you to come out. So I say, if you feel your hands are painful, go with that. That's probably where you need to work. You need to work on that. If you get to a point where it no longer, you're not feeling that pain the same, that's where you've built the resilience. But while you keep doing this, this is what you keep doing when your tummy turns in the supermarket. Oh, yeah. So it's no different. You don't leave it in the cold, that resilience, you take it with you, which is what Wim Hof is trying to, 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 to sort of educate people with, but his, his, his instructors are not always getting it, I don't think. But, you know, when you're getting into the cold, it has to be your individual experience. Obviously, we can watch. So, you know, I can see when people are looking for exits and it, it's subtle sometimes, but they just, their eyes will just go and they'll just, you know, they, or they'll look down and, you know, or their eyes will close, they'll go inward. The body will try anything to get you to come out because it doesn't want you to be there. It wants you to be sat on the sofa on a Saturday night with no work nice the next and comfortable, day. Yeah. Tummy full, yeah. bottle of your favourite drink, watching Saturday night telly with the kids, the dogs. Yeah. It wants you to be ventral vagal, wants you to be in a, a state of happiness and security and no vulnerability. That's where it wants you to be the minute you get in. In fact, there's a small part of the body that really wants you to be back in the womb when that happens. A very small part, if you read Bessel van der Kolk's book. And that's the, that's the nature of the nervous system to get you back to safety. So all these complex things are happening in the body. I think I've had enough. I think I'm done. You know, this isn't going to stop. My sensations are different to everybody else's. Why is nobody else doing this? You know, if you're in a group session, within five minutes, you've completely changed. Oh, actually, it feels okay. I get, can I stay in? Hang on a minute. Five minutes ago, you were ready to get out. So, so what's happened in that moment? there it is that's what you've done you've, you've changed your autonomic nervous system's perspective on something that originally felt dangerous or life threatening to hmm, I quite like it here which you then apply into real life sure so that's letting people that's giving people the you know this feels uncomfortable no been here before I can get through it yeah, and that happens quite in terms of how your autonomic nervous system puts you into that, whether it's just getting into a room full of crowded people or a lift, being you know, hemmed in or being in an abusive relationship or um, or your tummy turning in a supermarket. It's going to reduce that because it, it, your body and your mind start to build resilience to external environment. So you don't leave it in the cold. You, you're taking it away with you when you when you're walking about. It stays in the body. The human body's five hundred million years of evolution. It's much smarter than the human mind, you know. And we're only just sort of skimming the surface of that. I think nobody too. really talks about that bit. Everybody talks more about the benefits of inflammation, the thing, or you could potentially lose weight, or you could do. I'm just like, no, that's the important bit. That resilience. Yeah, that's the, that, that's the key. That's the key. Yeah, that's yeah. what Wim Hof's got after 38 years of yeah. doing it, is that he doesn't react. Nothing would, phases him. No, it would be interesting to, um, it would be interesting to make a really loud noise in a, if you had put Wim Hof in a group. Like trying to scare him or something. Yeah, his reaction would be very different. Yeah. Because his, you know, his amygdala driven fear isn't, as responsive as other people's. So this sort of leads into then autonomic dysfunction. Yeah. So if people are hyperventilating all the time in terms of buteco on, on the breath all the time, yeah. their perception of environment is always fear. Yeah. People <clears> get <throat> panic attacks, people who like get scared easily are always kind of highly strung and stuff. Sure, sure. And and, and that leads into loads of other dysfunction, you know, mental health problems and not that, just that, you know, special educational needs with, with kids now, which is rife. You know, in a, in a recent study in America, 80% of children with um, ADHD are breathing through their mouths, they're snoring at night, 80%. So it, 
So, <clears throat> and talk it, to me about that, about sleeping at night and breathing at night. Because we had a conversation, you told me about taping my mouth up. Yeah, which I've sure. not done yet, which I really do need to try. I know it's just a, another... Life-changing, that is, mate, I tell you. So yeah. Talk to me about that, about just taping your mouth up and what tape should it be and what's the reason for that? Um, because we're creatures of habit, we breathe through the mouth... Um, and we are breathing through the mouth for various reasons. Not enough time here to talk about it all, but there's loads of reasons why now human beings are breathing through the mouth more than ever. So if we breathe through the mouth during the day, there's a good possibility you're going to breathe through the mouth during the night yeah. because it's, hab it's habitual. There's a, there's a part in the brain called the, the pre botsinger complex, which sort of controls the sort of circuit rhythm of your breath. And it's controlling the little sighs that we have every now and again. And... Sometimes we can get into such a bad habit of breathing through the mouth and hyperventilating that we carry on doing it at night, which a lot of the time is snoring. Uh, and snoring is dysfunctional in, in human beings. Nobody should be snoring. Um, and it affects your hormone levels at night. It affects how you go to the toilet. It affects a lot of things in the body. And kind of about three or four days into me taping up, about 18 months ago, maybe a bit longer now, taping my mouth closed at night, I've, I've, you know, I, I don't ever get up to go to the toilet at three o'clock in the morning anymore, ever. Did you start panicking at first, like, because you've got something over your mouth? Is there a... Yeah, I did, yeah. And the first few nights was was a bit complicated. It was, you know, I was sort of trying to... I mean, now I sort of... I get this 3M micropore tape, yeah. just uh, medical tape, and I fold a bit back, I call it a panic tab, uh, and then I take a strip off about the width of my hand and I just put it across my lips seal it in and then and go to sleep on my left and the first few nights I was waking up trying to take it off which made me feel a bit panicky right um, because probably obviously I was probably a little bit more anxious at the time as well um, obviously that panic tab now that in case you get a bit panicky you can take it off um, but I'd say to anybody that wanted to do it you know try taping your mouth up during the day first maybe when you're just you're about the house or whatever just to see how you feel with it because, yeah. you know, breathing through the nose can be a big step for people. You know, I, I work with people who who cannot breathe through the nose because they feel such a drive to breathe because they've been used to getting in this huge amount of air through this big hole that's the mouth. So when they switch to nasal breathing, it's restrictive. So that alarms these chemoreceptors in the body who become oversensitive to carbon dioxide buildup in the body. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. Which then, the in, the instinct to drive to breathe then is is quite high and fast. So, so when you start breathing through the nose, the panic. I need, I'm not getting enough air. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why they didn't tell everybody during at the beginning of lockdown with COVID nineteen that, that they knew that if everybody was breathing through their noses, they probably had about a fifteen percent less chance of getting COVID, yeah. because your nose is the first line of defence against anything that's airborne, including COVID. And you produce nitric oxide in your nasal cavity and that kills COVID, believe it or not. But they also knew that if, you know, if Boris Johnson had come out at the time and said, look, everybody go home now, start breathing through your noses, that A&E departments would have just been full of people with anxiety and panic attacks. Yeah. Because if you try and breathe through your nose and you're not used to it, you won't be... <sighs> There'll be a drive to breathe because the CO2 tolerance is, will be quite low. Because of because of constant over breathing over the years, so a lot of this is sort of complex biochemistry. And when I trained to be a Buteco breathing instructor, when I learned all that, it completely changed my outlook on on breathing forever. Um, and I thought, yeah, the Wim Hof method is okay if if this sort of size shoe fits you, and yeah. you're not over anxious. Yeah, the holotropic breathing is uh, quite intense, isn't it? It's heavy, yeah. Minute heavy. And it's like, you know, I see people and I'm just like, maybe they should be doing alkaline breathing really and something a little bit more subtle before they're getting into that. Because you do that straight from the off, it's like... Yeah, it is, yeah. And that's, you know, that transformative breathing. How I mean, it's got its purpose. Obviously, it works amazing. And, you yeah. know, I've done it. And um, they're kind of out-of-body experiences. And you get a you get a big hit with it, which is why obviously everybody's going crazy now about breathing yeah. and doing these transformative sessions. Yeah, they're getting people in these big groups, yeah, yeah, yeah. getting them all hyperventilating. Yeah. But in terms of what you've been through in the past, your trauma, your PTSD, abuse, yeah. 
it will quickly snap you back to it because the body doesn't want you to breathe like that. So as soon as the autonomic nervous system witnesses that, it's like, whoa, 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 stop. Yeah. Why are you breathing like that? There's, there's nothing here. Your eyes are closed. There's nothing chasing you. Um, I can't smell danger. I can't hear it. I can't feel it. So why are you breathing like this? It wants you to stop. So the way it gets you to stop is it injects you with emotion from the past, which is why people that see the the program on telly with, with Wim Hof, all these yeah, presenters, yeah, like it, they were all in tears. Yeah, and these presenters and these these um, stars that were on the show, yeah. their autonomic nervous systems were just drip fed emotion from the time that it happened, mm. and um, and that's why it makes them you know incredibly emotional. But there's very there's, there's positive ways that we can use that in terms of reprocessing and resetting neural pathways from the past in terms of your abuse or your trauma, so we can get people to breathe hard. To, to invite the body to go back, invite the nervous system to go back. So, well, use that, that'll work. When you were abused, when you were 10, yeah, have that. And, and it'll bring it out in you again. And it, it'll just inject you with a bit of it. Maybe not even the memory, but it'll just let you feel what it felt like again at 10. Yeah. And, and, and then if you witness and feel that again in that moment, does that allow the brain then to reset neural pathways to experience that as a 40 year old? making it a little bit easier. Yeah. Powerful, so, isn't it? Yeah, it is powerful. And, 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 you know, and it's going to be used a lot more in the future. And I think over the next couple of years... What's it called again, the, the type of breathing? What do you call it? Well, there's this, there's, this transcendent, this transformative, yeah. the hyperventilation techniques, basically. Yeah. They're all ways of putting the body into stress. Yeah. Into stress response, sympathetic chain. Yeah. So... In terms of your nervous system, your parasympathetic, your rest and digest, your, your, your stress response, as soon as you start breathing through the mouth, you're, you're breathing into fear generally. So transformative sessions are normally sort of, you know, big, deep holotropic. breaths through the mouth. Yeah, and holotropic, which is, you know, created by Stanislav Grof in the, in the late 60s. Yeah. You know, um, this is putting the body into sympathetic drive. Yeah. So getting the body to, to feel fear. And trying to get you to, to, to go back. And, and it works. It really does work. But it doesn't work for everybody. Yeah. Because breath work isn't for everybody. You know, some people come into it. It's like, I can't do this. You know, they've booked transformative sessions with me. And they say, I can't do it. So that's okay. It's no problem. You know, some people can't. It's just too much to go back. Because they'll go instantly back to that moment. Depending on how sensitive they are as a human being. They'll quickly get back in there. And they might not want to see it again. So you have to kind of be careful how you use it. Right. What's, what did you say it was called? Butaki? What was it? Buteco. Buteco. And what, what's that then? Buteco. So Buteco is, is, um, is, is, is a method of um, ex an exercises, a method of training and breathing and exercises that was created by um, Constantine Buteco. Um, and I'm not the exact history, but you know he was working with young pilots and stuff, and, and people that had come out of the war who were in shell shock and who were hyperventilating, and and he was sort of focusing on the Bohr effect in the body, um, this mechanism that has to take place for gas exchange in the lungs, and using the Bohr effect to good effect is 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 amazing because it helps to undo asthma and it can be life-changing for people because it kind of changes how you perceive your environment because, um, you know, fear response is connected in a way to CO2 because your amygdala is, is affected by CO2 and, and the way that you're breathing. So it uses the, the body uses the breath to get you out of situations. So it's all kind of working together, if you, if you know what I mean. So... So Buteco is, is basically, I trained with Patrick McKeown um, in Ireland, although my, all my course was online. I trained with Patrick McKeown because he fascinated me really with, with his work. And, you know, he's been doing this for over, you know, 25 years. And he sounded like me. And when I started to listen to Patrick, his broad Irish, beautiful accent, and he talks about the bread, because when he says bread, it sounds like bread. Um, and he's, a, he's an amazing guy, he really, really is. And um, 
the way he explained it was, you know, he could break it down into layman's terms and he I, I made it understandable, you know, for me. But he was talking about himself in the past, you know, people waking up in the morning with your nose, stuffy nose, always getting th sore throats mm. all the time, you know, constantly snoring, feeling groggy in the morning, always got cold hands and feet. This was me, always on my inhaler when I was running. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't want that to carry on anymore. So, so that's why I did it. And within sort of six to eight months, I'd almost reversed something that I'd been I'd had for forty years of my life. Wow! And you know, when I first started to do it, I tried to tape my mouth shut when I was running, and I couldn't really get any more than about five hundred yards, Tim. But within six months, I did. You know, I ran half a marathon taped up, and uh, you know, and I didn't carry any inhaler with me, and that's unheard of because I've carried one in my pocket since I was fifteen when I've been running. So, you know, what's changed? You know, biochemistry. So you change the flexibility of your chemoreceptors in your body, change how you respond to carbon dioxide buildup in the body. It changes the way that you breathe forever. Wow. So, yeah, it's powerful stuff. <laughs> so what's next for Kev and Breath Evolution then? What's, what's, what, what, what's your... Obviously, the first thing, one thing you need to do is get a, an admin assistant or a or a PA or something, <laughs> don't you? To actually answer your messages and sort of like structure your diary and stuff. Yeah, sure. My business mind is rubbish, Tim. I know, but you just need to get somebody, just to, an assistant or something. Just, just one person it. assistant. Yeah, just, 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 just to take so much pressure off you, mate. I can't even imagine how many messages you get a day. It must be bonkers. It is bonkers, yeah. And I took Paul, um, Paul Smith, Paul the Joker, uh, he's a, a Scouse comedian and he's just, he's so funny, Paul. And he, he, he'd come up yesterday, but of course he's got massive following on Instagram. Mm, yeah. So of course I, I take him in the water, he puts a post on Instagram, which I said do anyway, because you yeah, know, yeah. put it out there. And the next minute, you know, there's just you know, thousands of more followers on there, more messages and more stuff all the time. Yeah. And I, I kind of, I suppose I am putting myself out there. So I'm, I'm creating a bit of a rod for my own back. But not for the wrong reasons, Tim. No, for your intentions, mate, always been right. You know, because yeah. there's been a few times where I've said, look, come in and let me help you do your thing, but you've never done because you want to do it the right way for you. And I think it is right because you are a, you're a breath coach called water therapist. Not just for an experience, people just come and try it out. Sure. Therapy. And you're doing it right, mate. You're doing it right by you and I. It's it meant. Yeah, it's, men. It's, it, it's working out well. And the, and the work that I'm doing with men now as well, it's so the Unguarded Warrior. Uh, so I'll give them a mention as well, the Unguarded Warrior with James O'Keefe. Yeah. Um, James O'Keefe's married to Beverly Knight, the singer. Oh, and right. He created the Unguarded Warrior retreats for men oh, amazing. Down, down south. And they're, they're brilliant, you know, they're really good. And as an introduction to men's work, they're, they're fantastic because yeah. male ego's horrible and it's yeah. causing a lot of problems. You know, it caused so many problems for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I couldn't be any further away from Alpha. Uh, um, yeah, I think that's the thing in it. It's just like if, if you know, when you were younger, you didn't fit in, or if you're not like myself, I didn't have a male role model when I was what's it. So when I come to my twenties, what's it? I overdid it. I yeah. thought I need to. Oh, and the ego got in the way of me fucking like growing and just like I'm all right. I look back, I'm right. I couldn't, I yeah. couldn't look at myself in the mirror. You know, yeah. at the points I'm just like I didn't like who I was, but you know I can do that now and. It is that ego thing for men's a fucking motherfucker. It, it's, it's a nightmare. It kind of runs the world, doesn't it? Yeah. Male ego. And we only have to look at the situation in Ukraine and Russia yeah. and that to know that it's just a dick comparing yeah. competition be between men. Yeah. That, and it's been so problematic. We only have to look at the Second World War for that and and and, and whatever that was or whatever that yeah. is. Um, and I'll be honest, yeah, if, if women we're ruling the world, it would be far better. And, you know, I put myself out there saying that and, you know, a lot of men are like, whoa, mate, that's a bit heavy, but it would be better yeah. because because they think differently to us. They, 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 not all of them, obviously, you know, but yeah, yeah. but generally they, they're, they're better than we are, yeah. you know, and you know, it all starts from that sort of divine femininity. So, you know, we don't need to, we don't need to fight for females anymore. We don't need to fight for food. Mm -hmm you know, we've evolved and we need to recognise that we don't need to walk around now with silverbacks um, yeah, beating yeah. our chests, trying to, you know, we just need to love one another and, and get by and get through, um, you know, you know, because we're all, we're all feeling the same way, which is what generally what comes out on these 
these men's retreats. You know, they turn up standing Pitching proud. Chesters. Yeah, they 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 stand up proud when they come in and they're kind of weighing everybody up, and everybody does it. You know, yeah. and they give you a hug and they'll have a bit of a feel of you and stuff. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah, it's what yeah, men do. Yeah. You know, it's what I do still. I still, I still catch myself doing it. Yeah. You know, but it's just part and parcel of being a guy. But as long as we know that we don't have to do that anymore, and I'm going to cry in front of you, yeah. and I'm going to tell you about my, my deepest, deepest, darkest secrets, yeah. and tell you that I have the same problems as you, and you have the same problems as me. Because the two most important words with, with mental health is me too. And... And that's what's coming to light in the in these retreats for men is that they're turning up and they say, God, I, I did that once. I felt like that. And, and they're bursting, they're bubbling. And that's what we want them to do. You know, we, we get them to do certain things, you know, standing in front of each other like this close to each other, looking into the eyes for a minute. Into, well, a total stranger. You total know, stranger, it, yeah. Wow. You know, what does that do? It's like... What does that do? It's very uncomfortable because it, we're not really supposed to be... Because you think straight off that's a... Uh, conflict, conflict straight, off you're going in. Yeah, and yeah. Then you just keep standing there. Sure. Keep looking, and you're just like, oh. Yeah, and then you move around, then you do it again. And then we do it again. And that first minute, it feels like five minutes. But again, once you keep doing it, and then all of a sudden, then there's a few giggles, a few smiles, a few laughs, a few hugs. It starts to break it down. The body starts to create this adaptation again. And not in the cold this time, but in a different scenario. So we've changed it, but the adaptation is the same. It's building resilience in human beings. Yeah. And it's okay to be here without fighting. We can be here as men, heterosexual men, and still have a cuddle and, you know, it's okay. Good that, isn't it? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, really loud. Yeah, I know, yeah, because it's right for up your street. Watching, what's that called again for the retreat? It, that's the, those are the unguarded warrior retreats. Unguarded warrior retreat. Is that what they are on Instagram? They are that on Instagram, yeah, as well. Yeah, and if people want to find you. What are you on Instagram? Breatholution. Yeah, it's, it's actually a breatholution. breathe-olution. Um, I think I just should have called it called it breatholution rather than revolution. I should have just dropped the E. I don't think it Is it too late? It's like Nike, Nike. It's just like <laughs> yeah, it's one of them. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah, but yeah. generally people say uh, breatholution. Yeah. But I wanted it to sound more like evolution, so I called it breatholution. <laughs> It don't matter, it's just Kev. It's just Kev, it is just Kev, yeah. It's just me getting into the water, yeah. It's just me breathing. Um, so yeah, breathevolution.com, you can go to breathevolution.com, yeah. My really rubbish, basic uh, website, which is, honestly, I have no time to go on it. You don't need a website. But Well, this is the thing, you know, you, you, you don't, you don't. I do what I do and it works. It works very well, but it helps. You know, like I said, it's... Depending on what you want to do, you need to get an assistant just to do your diary for you, mate, and just let you focus on what you're really good at doing. Sure. Is yeah, it, yeah. You, you've been put in this world to guide. You're a guide, aren't you? Apparently so, yeah. yeah. I'm a mechanic by trade, yeah. um, Tim, and, you know, I say by trade, you know, I've done all sorts of jobs. I've, you know, I've mined yeah. for semi-precious stone and been a tour guide, and I worked on the railway for 10 years as a signalman, um, and I've done loads of different jobs. Um, but this is the one job really that is this well I can't even call it a job I'll just go to work if I won the lottery tomorrow I'd still be doing it yeah. there's no way I'd stop doing it because I love what it does for people I'd probably do it in a bigger way and make it a bit more comfortable than being sort of sat next to a river in a, on a, in a pod there's um, something beautiful about that though <laughs> there is that. there is something beautiful yeah and it's amazing down there You know, down I think there. What, what I like about it is that it feels a bit raw and the, 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 say, the space isn't 100% safe and it puts you into a little bit more of a wilderness like I'm in the wild anything could kind of happen to me but when you're at a tree you kind of know that the surroundings you're in a safe place yeah you that, do that extra little bit when coming we have I'm just like yeah. it just adds to that that um, feeling of self worth that that fear, that fulfilment at the end of it of course absolutely mate yeah beautifully put and you know when you're getting into the cold Every experience is absolutely completely different. So, you know, where, where Kay does her um, cold water dips now, yeah. um, where she gets she gets in these little blue pods, doesn't yeah. she? So if it's sunny with the same five people and then she does it at night with the same five people, they'll feel completely different. Yeah. If it's hailstoning, they'll feel completely different again. If it's just raining, she'll feel different. You know, 
move them into different pods so they're facing different directions, it will still feel different. This is how sensitive the nervous system is. Yeah. And I witnessed that, you know, just quickly, I, I witnessed that when I was doing a session once, I had a session in the morning and I had a cancellation in the afternoon and I always go in backwards. I, took, I think I took you in backwards, yeah, yeah, yeah. you and Kay in backwards. So autonomically, my body just gets used to going in backwards into the water. So in the afternoon, I thought, I'll just do a session for me. So I did some breathing, got into the cold. I thought, Bloody, it feels much colder in here now, this afternoon. Same temperature as it was, as it was this morning. I thought, is it because I'm going in forwards? So I turned around, went in backwards, it felt better. Wow. What's the body doing? It's watching all the time. It's watching every move you make yeah. constantly. So it's not just a question of getting into the water. What is going on? Feel exactly what's going on in your body um, and, and be in control of that autonomic response yeah. in every condition. And every condition builds different levels of resilience. The different temperatures, obviously, then building different levels of resilience each time. Wim Hof, he's done them all. He's been in every temperature, every condition, every, you know, snow, hail at night, at night snowing, at night hailing, 30 odd years. There's no situation in cold water he hasn't been in. That resilience you build up doing all that. Yeah. Years. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. But as Neanderthals, this is what we were just on a daily basis. Yeah. Because we had to forage for food on the, you know, uh, around, the, around the, the coastlines of this country. Yeah. Um, and as animals, we were so efficient with the cold. And to get here, we've been fucking freezing to get to this point. And now we're just too warm. Yeah. We're too hot. And, and you know, you know, Wim Hof says that, you know, we're too hot. Everything's too this. You know, it's too easy. Food is just too available. You know, we've lost the ability to forage, to ground, yeah. to feel the earth under your feet. We're, we're losing what is innately our evolution, you know, sort of yeah. whole concept of, of evolution. And the, the only reason that we got here was with, was through being really cold and, and connected to the earth. And now we're, we're moving further away from that. When you get back to that. Sorry? You need to get back to feeling, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Oh, 100%. And getting back to connecting with the earth. Sure, I yeah. Love it. Feeling comfortable with uncomfortable. That's it's brilliant, that, yeah. We'll, that, we'll leave it at that, mate. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Kev, thanks for coming on. <laughs> that was an interesting really one, mate. <laughs> thanks so much, everybody. Thank Goodbye. you so much. Goodbye. Bye.